They're ready. It's recording. Okay. Go. Okay. Shalom, everybody. Yesterday, as uh, we spoke about, was Chof Ches Ir, Yom Yerushalayim, Baruch Hashem, the miracles that Hashem did for our people in 1948 and 1967 on the 28th day of Sivan during the Six Day War by reuniting us with Jerusalem. And sadly enough, in 1948, uh, the Arabs had attacked the Jews and they had taken certain uh, properties of Jews, including in a neighborhood called Shik. Sheikh Jara, they took certain Jewish properties that were privately owned. Today, the world is making a tumult going on the side of, of the Arabs uh, for trying to give, for the Jews trying to get back their personal property. Uh, we are praying for the welfare. Shalu Shalom Yerushalayim, and for all the inhabitants of Israel that through the turmoil they're going through now, they should all be gesund and well. We are now going to, huh? Sorry. We are now going to, to the Parsha Shia. It is Chumash Bamidbar. We begin the, par, uh, the book of Bamidbar. And it is also pre-Shavuot. Because Shavuos starts on Sunday night is Monday and Tuesday, so we will not be able to have another year before Shavuos. Therefore, we will include all of it. Tomorrow, Wednesday, on May 12th, is Rosh Chodesh Sivan. Don't forget to say Yalav tonight. And uh, tomorrow to do all the different things for Rosh Chodesh. And that, as the Torah says, Bachodesh HaShlishi Bo Midbar Sinai, that it was on the first Rosh Chodesh, seven, in the year 2448, uh, 33, 33 years ago, that the Jews came to Mount Sinai. And there they will be given the Torah. Now, as mentioned last week, the Chukesai is always read at least the Shabbos before the Shabbos before Shavuot in the circumstances that we are in this year because for us a Sunday night, there are certain years that Nosoi, no, this year doesn't. We're going to read Bamidbar this Shabbos. So Bamidbar is before Shavuot. And our sages find a lot of lesson in the fact that um, Bamidbar is always read before Shavuos. And amongst the lessons that they find is, let me just tell you what the opening verse of the Chumash is. By Daber Hashem El Moshe, and God spoke to Moshe Bemidbar Sinai in the desert of Sinai, be Oihel Moyed, in the tent of meeting. So the tabernacle had been put up. Be Echod Lachedesh Hasheni, the Shona Hashenish, the Tseisom Yeretz Mishraim Lemar, on Rosh Chodesh Iyar. On Rosh Chodesh of the second month, the second year after the Jews left Egypt. So they left on the first month, in the month of Nisan. <coughs> so here we are 13 months later. And they had put up the tabernacle one month before on Rosh Chodesh Nisan of the second year. And he says, see, U es Rosh Koladas Bene Yisrael, take a census of all the males of the Jewish people, 
Lemishpachaisom to their families, Lavesavoisom to their father's house, the Mispar Shemus called Zochar Legogaloisom. So they should be counted. Uh, actually, they were counted through a half shekel, not directly. Now, as I mentioned, it stresses that this was in the desert of Sinai because this is an introduction for the giving of the Torah. Amongst it is that we should realize the Torah is the property of everybody. A desert is a place called Hefka. It is not owned by any individual. The same thing, the Torah cannot be claimed by any <coughs> individuals or part of the Jewish people. It is there for the taking. Anybody who wants can go and acquire the Torah for themselves. Um, that's one of the lessons. Now, we are told, says Rashi, that there were actually three censuses of the Jewish people quite close, one after the other. The first was when the Jews left Egypt, the second time was after the sin of the golden calf. And at that time, Hashem had told them to build the, uh, ta uh, the tabernacle. And the third time was when the tabernacle was uh, actually built. And the Rebbe points out that these three censuses correspond to three stages of divine consciousness. When we left Egypt, our divine soul became manifest, but only in a general way. <coughs> and that is because we followed God blindly into the desert, but it didn't change us fundamentally. And that is similar to people possessing a simple faith in God and could even lay down their lives for God and for Jewish values, even though that those values have not yet affected their daily conduct. The second time, was when we were commanded to build the Mishkan and Hashem would dwell within us. So our divine soul became manifest enough to affect the way we think and feel, but it is Hashem who imposed this revelation from above. It wasn't yet the uh, self-refinement that we had to go. And therefore, whenever something is pushed upon you, the effect is temporary and transient. Finally, the third one, which is what this Chumash is talking about, is after the Mishkan is built and we began the service in the Mishkan. Then, <coughs> Our efforts were fully manifest and our self-refinement was the so open. And this is why the third census was in ER, not in Nisan. Because in Nisan, the word month of miracles expresses how Shem takes the initiative to take us out of all physical limitations. Iyar, the month in which we count the Oma, the entire month of Iyar is the only month of the year where every day of the month we are saying Abracha and Mitzvah and counting. And that shows our self-refinement. And so 
This month is the spiritual preparation for the giving of the Torah. And that also explains in the other censuses, it was only Moshe who was involved. Here we see in Pasuk Gimel that they should count every male of the Jewish people from 20 years old. Atovi Aharoin, you and Aharoin. We are told there were two shushbenim, two escorts. God, so to say, was escorted by Moshe Rabbeinu, whereas the Jewish people were escorted by Aaron. And this is that here we see in the third census, the lifting up of the Jewish people towards God. And then it tells us that each tribe had a nasi, a leader that they should be counted by. And the Torah goes on to tell us at length how each tribe uh, was counted and the amount <coughs> sorry, of people that there were in each tribe. It's interesting to note that um, Mesh uh, Yehuda has the uh, most amount of people. Yehuda has 74,600. And although the next number is Don, and Don has 62,000, and I'd like to point out that Don only had the, the tribe of Don the son of Dun, uh, of Jacob, he only had one son, Chushim, who was actually a deaf. And nevertheless, he has the second largest number. Now, this census takes place between the 12 tribes. We have discussed many times before that Yaakov had 12 sons. Now, Levi, is sometimes a part of those 12, and sometimes he is not. For example, in the uh, he, this census, in the camping of the Jewish people, he is not uh, counted. Instead, Joseph is counted as two. That was the blessing Yaakov gave Joseph. Menashe and Ephraim, will be uh, two tri counted as two tribes, and they are the tribe of Joseph. So a Levi is not counted in this census. Levi will be uh, counted separately, and he will be counted from one month up, not from 20 years like the rest of the Jewish people. So they would not be part of that census. If you take Menashe and Ephraim together, Menashe has 32,000 and Ephraim has 40,000. So together that's over 72,000. So although Joseph is divided into two tribes, if you would take them together, uh, they would be just under uh, Judah. So it's very interesting to, to look at all the uh, different numbers. Altogether, we are told the Jewish men who were counted added up to 603,550. However, the tribe of Levi was not put in that counting, as I said, Levi would be counted separately. They are, so to say, God's legion, and they would be counted from a month upwards. And then the Torah goes on to tell us how the Jewish people traveled. And that is also a very fascinating aspect. <coughs> we have, obviously, four directions. And so in the four directions, you have the middle camp 
and the middle camp is the Mishkan itself. And uh, around the Mishkan, you have uh, Moshe Rabbeinu, that's uh, on the one side, and then you have the um, three families of of the um, Levi. So you have as far uh, as you have Mary. Moshe, Aaron, and Aaron's sons um, on the front side, and um, they uh, in the middle was, as I say, the tabernacle. So Moshe, Aaron, and his sons were on the east, and um, then you have the three families of Levi. Gershon, Kahos, and Merari. And uh, so uh, Gershon was on the west, Merari is the uh, north, and Kahos is the south. And then you have also the way the Jewish people camped, and that is in chapter 2, verse 3. On the east side, you have three tribes, Yehuda, Yisachar, and Zavulon. And uh, in the north you have, um, they came actually last. So then you have, after them goes the Reuven, Shimon, and God. They faced the tribe of Kahas. You heard the Yisachar Zavulon, by the way, were facing Moshe and Aaron. And then you have Binyamin, Menashe, and Ephraim facing Gershon. Those are all the children of Rachel. And the last is Dan, Asher, and Naphtali. They were facing Merodi. Now, these four camps of three tribes per camp also had flags, it's three colors. Each tribe had its own color. So each, each camp had the three colors, each flag, I should say, had the three colors. And those colors, by the way, came from the stones on the breastplate because Aaron had the 12 stones on his breastplate. Each one was a precious stone with a different color. So the color of the stone was the same as the color on the flag. Now, Rashi points out that next to Moshe, Aaron and Aaron's sons were the tribe of Judah, Yisachar, and Zebulun. And next to Kahas were Ruvain, Shimon, and God. And so we learn how good it is for the righteous and good for the neighbor that who is influenced by him. And Oile Rosha, Oile Shchoina, woe to the wicked and woe to the neighbor. Who was, who was a descendant of Kahos? That was Karach. And who joined Kedach in the rebellion? That was the tribe of Reuven. Dosan and Aviram and all came from Reuven and Shimon also. So those are the people who participated. So you see that a bad neighbor can be a very, very um, terrible influence. Amongst the things that we learn from a census in itself is how important each individual is. And um, because even though we are counting, nevertheless, the um, aspect of, of each person comes out importantly. And that's why, by the way, um, the Torah in the second verse says, see u esrosh, lift up the people. And lift up the people is when you take a, a counting that, that um, denotes each person. 
In fact, the Ger Rebbe, the Chidush Arim, says that the whole book is called the Book of Numbers. And in Hebrew, it is Sefer HaPikudim. Why is there such a stress that um, in this book, we have the census of the Jewish people taken twice? And his answer is that we have a law in Basavacholov, in milk and meat, that if you have, for example, a chicken soup cooking and milk falls into it, then we say it is bottle. It becomes bottle beshishim. It is nullified in 60. Sometimes something is bottle berop. Just with a majority, it can become a nullified. But there is a law called Dova Shebeminyan Afila Be'elef Loi Bottle, that if something is sold individually by counting it, then even if it becomes fall, it falls into something that has a thousand times the amount Loi Bottle, it never becomes nullified. And this, he says, is true about Hashem and the Jewish people. The Almighty foresaw that the Jewish people will be going into exile one day. By counting each Jew, he showed us that we are a precious entity. And then a Philip even in a thousand, a hundred thousand, the Jewish people will always maintain their identity and never become nullified through, through um, uh, assimilation or anything else like that. Now, it tells us that they established their genealogy according to their father's household, according to their pedigree which is what we call a pedigree in Hebrew is called yichus. I'm sure many people have heard the word yichus. How important, how much value should be attached to yichus? So he tells that there is a story that the Mizrich Magid, Rabdov Be'er of Mizrich, when he was a young boy of five or six years old, he once came home from Cheder, from his yeshiva learning, he saw his house burning down and his mother was crying terribly. And to comfort her, the little boy said, Ma, please don't cry. It's only a home. God will one day provide us a much bigger and beautiful home. So the mother said, I'm not crying because of our home. I know it is only a physical thing, but you see, we had a document of ancestry which discusses, describes our family tree all the way back to King David. And now because of the fire, it's burnt. We won't have, we don't have it anymore. And the little boy Beryl said, that's not a reason to cry either. Because if your old yichus was destroyed, then a new yichus will start with me. And um, we are told yichus really is a bunch of zeros. If you are a number before him, then your yichus, you count too. And that's why it says, Ish roish leves avesov. Who, it adds the word who, that if you are your, in your own right, a macha, a proper person, then there is something about you too. And um, the Torah actually discusses three reasons why we counted the Jewish people. 
So the first verse tells us about Moshe and Aaron doing the counting. He says that Ramban. And this is that every Jew had to come before Moshe and Aaron with their half shekel. And that was that you came before the greatest of all prophets and his holy brother. And the Sadiqim would look at them with their holy eyes and pray to Hashem on their behalf. Similar as it was in our generation when so many thousands of people would pass before the Rebbe. Not them giving the Rebbe a half shekel, but actually him giving a dollar to the half shekel. And then it says that they were counted from 20 kol yoytze tzava, all those who go out to war, because if not for the sins of the spies, the Jewish people would have gone into Israel immediately. And that would have involved fighting the inhabitants, conquering the land. And so we have to determine how many Jews are available to join the Tzivais Hashem, the army of God. And the third reason, says the Ramban, is that originally, when the Jewish people came down to Egypt, there was 70 souls. After 210 years, we reached 603,550. And this demonstrated to the Jewish people how much Hashem loved them. So after counting the Jewish people, we then go on to talk about and how they were going to be uh, traveling. We go on to talk about the children of Aaron and Moshe. And interestingly enough, it says these are the children of Aaron and Moshe, and then only mentions Aaron's sons, not of Avihu, Elazar, and Isamar, and not of an Avihu passed away. So Rashi points out, why does it say these are the children of Aaron and Moshe and only mention Aaron's children? And he says, because there's the physical parent, that was Aaron. And then there is the spiritual parent, the one who teaches us Torah, and that was Moshe Rabbeinu. So Moshe Rabbeinu was the spiritual father of Aaron's children. And then we read about the, <coughs> as I mentioned, the tribe of Levi being counted from a month old. Now, even though the uh, tribe of Levi was, um, even though the tribe of Levi was counted from a month and the rest of the Jewish people were counted from 20 years up. So you imagine there would be a lot more Levia. Nevertheless, they were actually the smallest amount they were only 22,000. Comes the question, um, why were the Levium such a small number? And again, the Ramban says that it says the, Jew, the Egyptians, when the Jews were in exile, in Egypt, the Egyptians said that they are going to enslave them and in that way, they are going to decrease the number of Jews that will survive. But the Torah says, Cain Yerbu, that the Jewish people multiplied miraculously in a most miracle fashion. It says the Ramban, who multiplied miraculously? those Jews who were enslaved in Egypt. The tribe of Levi was never enslaved. And as a result, because they were never enslaved, they didn't uh, multiply as miraculously. And so they were only 22,500. Another point about it is that um, 
the uh, Levim would be supported to by the um, Jewish people. So Hashem made that they shouldn't be that much. And now we go into the laws of what will be the Pidyan Haben. As we know, originally, in fact, we know that also from Jacob and Esau and Yitzchak, the Kohen, the sir, the representative of God in each family was the firstborn. That was the whole tumult of buying the firstborn and all that. When the Jewish people sinned with the golden calf, they committed idolatry. It became decreed that the firstborn cannot be God's, the Jewish people's representatives to God's anymore. The tribe of Levi were the only ones who did not participate in the golden calf whatsoever. And it was decided that the Kohanim, the tribe of Levi, will be the servants of Hashem. So in order to transfer from the firstborn being the so-called Kohanim to the tribe of Levi, they counted, that's what we are going to read in chapter three, verse 39. And they counted how many firstborn there were. Now, in the Levi, as we told you, there were 22,000 Levim. When they counted up the firstborn of all the 12 tribes, the firstborn males, it came to, of those 603,550, there were 22,000 273 that were first born. So Hashem told Moshe Rabbeinu, what you're going to do is as follows. The 22,000 first born will expiate themselves on the 22,000 Levim. That left over 273 first born that had no corresponding Levi, and he would have to give five shekels that would go to the Kohanim. And that would be the Pidyan Haben, the um, redemption of the firstborn. And that applies till today, where we have the Pidyan Haben as it was in that portion. Now, Rashi tells us that Moshe Rabbeinu had a problem. He had to tell of the 22,273 firstborn of the Israelites, 22,000 would just be transferred onto the 22,000 Levim. 273 of those people would have to give five shekels. So as she says, any person, any firstborn that Moshe Rabbeinu would come to and say, why don't you volunteer to give the two hundred, the five shekels? He'd say, no, 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 I'm one of the 22,000. So Moshe Rabbeinu had to resort, <laughs> believe it or not, to sit down and write 22,000 times on a block, uh, Levi, and 273, uh, 273 times five shekels. And each firstborn came, and then they uh, got whatever they got. And uh, then the Torah goes on to tell us, <coughs> after counting the Levium, the job that the different three families of Levi, Gershon, Kahos, and Merari would have. Uh, Gershon, <coughs> Kahos, who's the holiest, they would have to carry the vessels of the uh, Mishkan itself. And um, then 
Kahas uh, and Marari and Gershon, they would have to uh, carry the uh, Gershon would carry the curtains and Marari would carry the beams. And in that way, they would transport the Mishkan. So that's basically the uh, Chum, the Pasha of Bamidbar. And that is the census, the details of the encampment, the Aaron's family, and the census of the Levites, the male firstborn, and the duties of Kohos's descendants. And now I left time purposely, we went through the portion a little quicker than normal to leave time because next week, Sunday night, Monday and Tuesday is the great festival of Shavuot, which is on the 6th and 7th of Sivan based on the calendars we have today. Shavuot, of course, is the um, giving of the Torah. And uh, the Shavuos has a few different uh, names. And amongst the names, Shavuot itself is called Shavuos for two reasons. Shavuot means week. And it is seven weeks that we counted in the Omer. Sheva Shavuot is Tispar, and on the 50th day will be Shavuot. So it reminds us of the seven weeks we just counted. And Shavuot, taking a Shavuot also means a promise. So the name Shavuot comes from two promises. Shavuot is promises in plural. And that is that when Hashem gave the Torah to the Jewish people, they promised to obey him and remain faithful to him. And in return, God promised he would always cherish the Jewish people and not exchange them for any other people. We are the chosen people and remain so. That is Shavuos, not like some other religions want to claim. It is also called Yom Habikurim, because that was the day that the Jews brought their new fruit. That was the time of the um, harvesting of the first fruits. It is also called in our prayer, Zaman Matan Terasenu, uh, the time that we were given the Torah. And finally, it is also called Atzeres, just like Shmini Atzeres. Atzeres means to close. Shmini Atzeres is the closing of Sukkot. So too, Shavuos is the closing of Pesach. Uh, Pesach, we were taken out of uh, the Egypt. We got our freedom. But freedom without the Torah is not real freedom. And uh, one of the reasons why it's also called atzeres, which means to hold back, close and to hold back, is because all the other mitzvahs, in addition to holding back from work, there's a special mitzvah to perform. On Pesach, you eat matzah, sukkah, you sit in the sukkah, Rosh Hashanah, you blow the shofar, Yom Kippur, you fast, shvuas has no special mitzvah affected to it, it is the time of the giving of the Torah. And so it is Ratzeres, the refraining from Teda. And the word Shavuot actually carries the name of all the mitzvahs. So the Sheen is Shavuos, the base is Pikurim, the Ayin is Ratzeres, and the Tuf is the Torah. We also know that when Hashem wanted to give the Torah to the Jewish people, he asked them for a guarantor. And they said, Benenu Arevim Ba'adenu, our children will be uh, our guarantors. We'll get back to that. Everybody 
who knows about Shavuos, the first thing that comes to mind after the fact that we stay up all night, the night of Shavuos, we stay up, which is Sunday night, and Monday, we once again receive the Torah. I'd like to point out that Rebbe already in 1980 or 81 started the campaign that every Jew should be in the shul for the giving of the Torah. Even babies in the mother's arms, as we see, the tribe of Levi were counted from 30 days. So babies in mother's arms should also come to receive the Torah, benenu areven badenu, because we, it is the children that were our guarantors and the reason Hashem gave us the Torah. So I hope everybody will be in shul on Monday to hear the Ten Commandments. Tuesday, the second day of Shavuos, we also say Yiskert, so make sure that you are there. If you ask most people, what do you associate Shavuos with? So as I said, besides the giving of the Torah, the staying up all night, and the reading of the Ten Commandments, it is eating dairy meals on the first day of Shavuot, having cheesecake, blintzes, and all those dairy delicacies. And so why do we have dairy on the first day Shavuos? I'll give you seven different reasons for it that they give. But before I do that, I'd like to, 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 to um, point out that within the Shulchan Aruch of the Alter Rebbe, he says that although we have a milk cheesecake and things like that, a milk meal on the first day of Shavuos, it does not exempt you from having a Yom Tov meal on Shavuos with chicken or meat. So obviously you wait an hour or so after your cheese meal, and then you have the regular Yom Tov meal with it all. In our shul, in Chabad of Linters, we are going to be having brachas. We haven't had brachas for a year, but we will be having a cheesecake, actually compliments of kosher world and compliments of friends bakery. And so um, you're welcome to, to go to a, a Shavuos bracha where they have the cheesecake. And then when you go home, you have a Yom Tov meal. So now I'm going to give you the seven reasons I give for why we have dairy on the first day of Shavuos. In the Shira Shirim, the um, Shlomo HaMelech says, the sweetness of Taita drops from your lips and it is like honey and milk under your tongue. So in Shira Shirim, Shlomo compares Torah to milk and therefore we have uh, a dairy meal. And um, just like milk is better in earthenware and spoils quickly in silver or gold utensils, so too Tater remains with the humble and doesn't like the arrogant. A second aspect is that one of the Noahite laws for all people is that you're not allowed to eat the limb of a living animal. Aver menachai. So the Gemara asks, why can we drink cow's milk? Doesn't it come from a live animal? And he answers that since the Torah praises Israel as Eretz Zovas Cholov Udvash, it's a land that flows with milk. And therefore we see it is permitted and not forbidden. But since 
that was only after the Jewish people received the Torah that we read it is an Eretz Zavas Cholov, therefore it became permitted then. Another point they give is that Moshe Rabbeinu was born on the seventh of Adar. As we know, his mother hid him in a basket for three weeks. And then, I mean, three months. <coughs> she hid him in a basket for three months. And three months later, when she put him in the basket, she hid him in the house for three months. And then on the third month, she put him in a basket and put him on the bank of the river. And Batya, the daughter of Pare, found him and he refused to drink the milk of any of the Egyptians. And she was forced to hire Yocheved, his mother, to raise him. Now, if you work out, seventh of Adar, so Nisan Iyar Sivan. So the third month is basically the sixth of Sivan. And so Moshe Rabbein, who would, through, who years later, the Torah was given on the 6th of 7. Therefore, since he was reunited with his mother on the 6th of 7 through milk, we drink milk. <coughs> Another point is that Cholov numerically value is Ches is 8, Lamed is 30, Base is 2, 30, Two and eight is 40. So it shows you that Moshe reminds you that Moshe was up in Mount Sinai to receive the Torah. And the fifth reason is <coughs> that the Jewish people, I mean, the angels, when Moshe Rabbeinu was up in Mount Sinai, they wanted to attack Moshe for coming to steal the Torah and take it down to earth. And Hashem made Moshe's face look like Avraham. And he said to the angels, aren't you embarrassed to attack the person who was so hospitable to you? And since Avraham served the angels cream, milk, and only then meal, a lamb, therefore, <coughs> We have shvuas, a dairy meal, and a meat meal later. And the um, eating of, in the Beis HaMikdosh, they, they had on shvuas, the uh, lechem abikurim, the two, two breads. And therefore, we have a eating of a meal you have two separate loaves for the milk and for the meal. And the most common answer given is that it is only on Shavuos that the Jews learned the laws of Shechita and have to, to separate between milk and meat. And because they didn't know properly how to shecht the meal, they had to shecht the animals, therefore they ate milk. And the final thing is that the Bikurim uh, is um, in the law of Bikurim, it says, Lois Sevashal Gedi Bachalev Imoy. Now, there's a very famous question, and that is <coughs> that we are told King David was born on Shavuos uh, and his yard site was on Shavuos. And that is one of the reasons, there are many reasons, but that is one of the reasons why we read the famous book of Ruth. Some people read the book of Ruth on Shavuos. Ruth was the ancestress of King David and um, he is connected to Shavuos. But you'll ask yourself, <coughs> what date did King David pass away? It was the 7th of Sivan, the second day of Shavuos. In Israel, Shavuos is only one day. So how can you say 
that Moshe Rabbeinu passed away on Shavuos, and it's the seventh day of Sivan. By the way, who passed away on the first day of Shavuos, the sixth of yeah. Sivan, was yeah. the holy Baal Shem Tov in the year 1760, oh, yeah, the founder yeah. of the Hasidic movement, Rabbi Yisrael Baal Shem Tov, his yard site is on Shavuos. And there are many talks of the Rebbe where he connects Meish Rabbeinu, the hero who brought us the Torah, who gave, God gave us the Torah through Meish Rabbeinu on Shavuos. David HaMelech, who the Gemara says, his yard site is on Atzeres and Shavuos, and the Baal Shem Tov is, his yard site is on Shavuos. And as I said, the, the Rebbe makes a connection in many ways between those three. But the answer as to how we can say that Dovra Melech's yard site was Shavuos and then say the second day Shavuos. And by the way, it's ironic that in Israel itself, <laughs> Dovra Melech's yard site is the day after Shavuos because in Israel, they only have Shavuos one day. So the answer to that is, if you look at the Torah, every Yom Tov has its own date. Rosh Hashanah is the first of Tishrei. Uh, Yom Kippur is the 10th of Tishrei. Pesach is the 15th of Nisan. Sukkot is the 15th of Tishrei. Look for a date of Shavuos in the Torah. You won't find one. The Torah doesn't give you the actual date. The Torah says that after the, from the second day of Pesach, after you brought the sacrifice of Omer, you should count 49 days, seven, day, seven weeks, 49 days. And on the 50th day, you should make Shavuos. But it doesn't say what day Shavuos is. Now, why not? Because we know, today we have a calendar, so it is all set. But in the days of the Beis HaMikdosh, the Jews used to go to look to spot the moon. If they spotted the moon, then that month would have 29 days. And if they didn't spot the moon, then that month would have 30 days. So a month, a Hebrew month can either have 29 or 30 days. Now there are two month endings between Pesach and Shavuos which is the end of Nisan and the end of Iyar. Our months go 30, 29, 30, 29. The end of Nisan has 30 days and the end of Iyar, which is today, has 29 days. Tomorrow is the first of Sivan. And when you have 30 and 29 or 29 and 30, then 50 days after Pesach will be the 6th of Sivan. But in the time that the Torah of the Beis HaMikdosh, it was possible for both the end of Nisan and the end of Iyar to either have 29 days or both have 30 days. If they both have 29 days, then Shavuos would be one day earlier on the 5th of Nisan. If they both have 30 days, then Shavuos would be one day later on the 7th of Siva. And so the answer is that the year that King David passed away, both months, Nisan and Iyar, had 30 days. And as a result, David HaMelech passed away on Shavuos, which that year was the 7th of Siva. And so the Talmud tells us that Ba'atzeres, on the day of Shavuos, um, King David passed away. And that is the day that he is elevated. I want to wish everyone a good Shabbos and a good Yom Tov. Enjoy your night up studying Torah. Enjoy your cheesecake. And we'll see you, God willing, in two weeks. It's lovely seeing Ivan, Errol, Mandy, Irwin, and all those who are with us. Have a wonderful Yom Tov. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Shkia, thank you. Shkia. Good Shabbos with Yom Tov. Thank you. Shabbos thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Erwin.